I'm audible online, right? Perfect. All right. Okay. A warm welcome to all of you, even as we get into the Gospel of John. Okay. So this is the course that we will be going through. Uh, we will go through it literally chapter by chapter. Uh, we may not be able to cover every single verse, but uh, we will um, at least look at the highlights of each chapter. And then uh, after we are done with um, the Gospel of John, we will also look at the three epistles of John, 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. Uh, so um, today will be more an introduction. And then we will look at a portion of the first chapter. And um, then even as the weeks go by, you know, we can go into greater detail. So uh, you're already familiar as you're in the third year, you're already familiar with the way that we do our assessments. So as usual, you would have a midterm assessment and then you will have your final assessment. So the midterm assessment and the final will be 50-50 marks and it will be a multiple choice. Uh, so yeah, that will be easy. So you don't you won't have any written uh, papers as such. Okay. So we'll begin with an introduction to the Gospel of John. We will look at who wrote this Gospel of John. Um, is there any verse in the Gospel of John which says, "I so and so am the writer of this book"? Anything comes to mind when you were, you know, look at somewhere the maybe the first chapter of John. Is there any verse over there which says so and so has written this gospel? Do we find anything like that? If you see in this gospel, the writer does not name himself. In a few places, he calls himself by a title which he uses. He says, the one whom Jesus loved, or the disciple whom Jesus loved. That is just the term that he uses to refer to himself. He never calls himself John. So how can we know whether it is John who wrote this particular book? Or you know, could we say that someone else wrote it? Whom is this term, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Whom is this term referring to? Why do we say that it is John who has written this? So this is basically the argument which scholars used. Um, they observed that there were three persons, three disciples who were quite close to Jesus. Jesus seemed to give them extra training. You know, on certain occasions, when a certain miracle had to be performed, he chooses these three disciples specifically, and he says, you come along with me. Uh, so they are like the inner circle. They are the people who are being um, given extra training, maybe because they were people who were catching the spiritual truths at a deeper level. Maybe they were people who were more uh, eager and more devoted to learn. So we don't really know why Jesus chose these particular three, but they were basically Peter, James, and John. James and John, of course, were brothers. So these are the three that Jesus seemed to uh, place extra focus on, even as he was training them. So the argument which people make is that maybe this term, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who you know is supposed to have written this gospel, it could either be Peter or James or John. Peter, however, gets disqualified from being the author simply because in some verses, you have Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved being mentioned together in the same verse. And they are mentioned as two separate persons. Let's look at one example of that. Um, John chapter 13, verses 23 to 25. If we were to look at John 13, 23 to 25. And if we could have someone read out for that, either online or here in the class, um, if we can have someone read out for us. John 13, 23 to 25. Now, there was 
leaning on Jesus' bosoms, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, Simon Peter, therefore mentioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? So here you have Peter being mentioned and you have this disciple whom Jesus loved being mentioned and they are two separate persons. So Peter cannot be this person you know, who calls himself, this author who calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. In the same way, even James is not considered the writer because James gets martyred by um, Herod quite early, you know, um, even before the Gospels were written, uh, you know, James gets martyred. That we find details of that in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where it says that um, James, the brother of John, was put to death with a sword by Herod. So, which is why it is generally believed that this author, who only refers to himself with the title, the disciple whom Jesus loved, it must be talking about John. Okay, so that's the understanding. Um, now, why do you think John used this title for himself? Why couldn't he have just simply named himself and said, you know, I, John? Why did he choose to use a title like this? Um, there are two reasons which are generally given. Um, he was writing to people who are wondering whether they should become followers of Jesus or not. So he writes this entire gospel to prove to people that Jesus is the living God, that Jesus is the Messiah whom, who was talked about in the Old Testament. So he tries to write this entire gospel to show people that Jesus Christ is the Messiah whom they have always been waiting for. And he wants the people to believe his testimony. He wants them to believe what he is writing about this Jesus. So he probably used this title to give them the assurance that he is he's somebody whom Jesus knew personally. He is somebody uh, who interacted with Jesus on a daily basis. Uh, so whatever he's whatever testimony he is giving, they can trust it because he's an eyewitness who has seen things, who has heard things. And uh, so he, whatever he's recording in his gospel, it's all things which he has actually seen and witnessed. So maybe he used this term to help people understand that he's someone trustworthy, that he's someone that Jesus personally knew and loved so that they will take his testimony seriously. But at another level, we can also see how this um, title, which John uses for himself, um, has a personal significance. He did not just see himself as a follower or a disciple. Whenever he talked about himself or thought about himself, he thought about himself as the disciple whom Jesus specially loves. It's not a, uh, out of pride that he thought of himself in this way. It, he grasped the truth that he is that valuable, that he is that precious to Jesus. So he took a teaching which Jesus has taught to many people and he personalized it and made it his own. Do we do that? Because, I mean, when you look in, um, uh, you know, that verse where Jesus says that he... He loves us in the same way that the Father has loved him. Yeah, that would be John 15, 9. In John 15, 9, this is what Jesus teaches. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And over there, the you is plural. Jesus is giving the teaching to all his disciples who are sitting in front of him. And he says, in the same way the Father loved me. You can imagine how great and vast the love of the Father must be for the Son. So with the same kind of love with which the Father has loved me, I love all of you, is what Jesus is sharing with the disciples. And one disciple catches that, takes hold of it, and makes it his own. From that day, you know, he probably began to think of himself as, I am the one who is loved as much as the Father loves Jesus. 
that's the amount that i am loved by jesus so is there any scripture you know in your own personal walk which you have taken hold of which you have personalized for yourself and um, you know you you look at yourself through that verse because that's what john did and that is what maybe we all should do as well um for me one scripture that really speak has spoken to me personally was john 10:10 10, because that's the verse in which jesus says you know that the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but he came with a very different purpose he came so that the sheep can live life to the full you know it says in john 10:10 10, 10, that they may have life and have it to the full and i've not had a very easy life and so this has been a very beautiful reminder to me that jesus came into this world to not to steal kill and destroy me but to give me life and to give it to the full so i or no see myself as a sheep i have taken hold of a teaching and personalized it for myself and have understood that it applies to me personally specifically so i think that's something that we can learn from john where we take hold of a general teaching which jesus has given to everyone and we are able to see the truth in it and we make it our own something that is applicable to us personally in our walk with him uh, so here we see john considering himself as the one whom jesus loves and this is a term which he uses throughout his gospel he in fact um mentions it one two five times he you know he uses this specific term every time uh, when he refers to himself he thinks of himself as the one whom jesus loves um so let us look at this relationship that this man had with jesus what is his first encounter with jesus most people believe uh, that john chapter 1 verses 35 to 40 probably refers to john and andrew okay um if you were to go to your john chapter 1 verses 35 to 40 it just says over there that john the baptist was walking along with two of his disciples it doesn't mention the names of those two disciples but john the baptist was walking along along with two of his disciples and then he sees jesus and immediately he says to his disciples you know look that jesus he is the one he is the lamb of god and these two disciples when they hear that immediately they leave john the baptist standing over there and they start following jesus because they are eager to know him and um, uh, so uh, they go to jesus and then um, they ask him where are you staying that would be john chapter 1 verse 38 uh, they said rabbi where are you staying and then jesus says to them come and and you will see so jesus actually takes them to his home you know wherever he's staying at that particular point of time and it says that they spent that day with him so that entire day they spend it with jesus and then in verse 40 we are told that andrew is one of those disciples and the general belief is that the other disciple must have been john so that is uh, his first encounter with jesus where jesus doesn't just simply say hi to them and walk away he says come and i'm willing to spend time with you and these two disciples go with him and they spend that entire day with him so that is how a relationship is built up you know it's not just that 5 minutes of uh, bible reading that we do or a prayer that we just say when we are in a time of need that doesn't build up a relationship jesus says come spend the day with me and then are you willing to go into his presence and spend the day with him if you do that you start building your own personal relationship with him and then you will have your own personal title through which you look at yourself you know you may call yourself the sheep that jesus loves or you may think of yourself as the disciple you know that he has uh, uh, given special favor to so you 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 develop a relationship with him and in that relationship you start identifying with him in a particular way and it becomes a very very personal thing so we see that uh, john had his first encounter with jesus here 
where he gets to spend the entire day with Jesus and start getting to know him. And we also, another thing that we see about this John, uh, we see that he was an influential person. The general belief is that all the disciples were very poor people. I don't think that was quite true. Some of them were wealthier. Some of them were more influential. Where do we get that from? Uh, we see that in John chapter 18, verses 15 and 16. So if you were to go to John 18, 15 and 16, and maybe if we could have someone read out for us uh, both of those verses. Yeah, I think, yeah. John 18, 15 and 16, if someone could read out, please. John 18, 15 and six, uh, 16. And Simon Peter followed Jesus. And so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the uh, courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. So here we have um, Peter and John following Jesus after his arrest. You know, the other disciples were very scared and they have all run away to their homes. But Peter and John don't want to just go away. They want to know what's going to happen to Jesus. They're concerned. They're worried. And so they are kind of following at a distance, you know, behind. And then uh, Jesus is taken into the uh, courtyard of the high priest. And John, it says over here, was known to the high priest. So he had personal uh, acquaintance with the high priest. So he must have been influential. So he's able to enter inside. But Peter, you know, who doesn't have any kind of influence, he has to wait outside. And then uh, John goes and, you know, um, um, gets permission for him also to enter inside. So we see that John was somebody who had some uh, political influence, was probably from a wealthier background. Um, another thing that we see about this author of the book of John is that he is a very fiercely loyal person. When all the other disciples ran away and hid, Peter and uh, John actually continue to follow Jesus. They have the guts to even enter into the high, high, uh, high priest courtyard, though, of course, you know, Peter denies Jesus. Uh, but then a significant thing which we see at the cross, we see that um, John is actually standing over there with the ladies. Well, by uh, now we see that this disciple whom he never refers to, you know, by name, it is himself. And here it clearly says because this disciple was known to the high priest. And the high priest probably would not really know people who are poor and <laughs> insignificant. So uh, he probably is from a more, um, you know, aristocratic family. Uh, so he has contacts and his family probably owned many boats. So they, he was not just one fisherman with one boat. They probably had a fleet of boats. So they probably were well off. You know, so, so while the other disciples were busy hiding, this man openly stands over there at the foot of the cross. I mean, that doesn't seem like a very significant thing for us today. But picture it back in those days. The man who is on the cross is being condemned, crucified in the, with, the, with the worst kind of punishment possible available in their times and this is stigma attached to the cross it's a humiliation where you are stripped of all your clothes and hung over there like as if you're some cheap thing and everyone who's passing by can come and stare at you so it's a very humiliating scenario and here are these ladies standing firmly over there at the cross willing to identify themselves with this person who's hanging over there they're not ashamed to be identified with him and along with them is this one disciple John, who is also willing to stand over there at that foot of that cross and be identified with that person who's hanging over there naked. I mean, it shows how fiercely loyal he was towards his Lord. And that is probably why, you know, Jesus says to him, you know, take care of my mother. So we see that in um, John chapter 19, verses 25 and 26. 
uh, in verse 26 it says when jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here is your son so he commits his mother into the hands of john now if a few of the other disciples also were standing there i'm not sure i mean whom you know jesus would have turned over his mother to uh, he would have had more options but right now there's only one disciple who actually showed up over there who has the who has that loyalty and love to stand over there and be identified with someone who's being hung on that cross so jesus sees him sees his loyalty and thinks my mother will be safe with this person and so he commits his mother into the hands of john so this is the kind of person who has written this gospel of john so we know we kind of looked at these details to kind of get a feel of this author of the kind of person that he was the kind of heart that he had uh, that is what we you know we have been uh, seeing now um, can we just simply conclude that this disciple whom Jesus loved is John and John is definitely the author? Uh, we are not doing it just like that. Uh, we are making this conclusion also based on some written records of some early church fathers. Now, you see, John had a disciple um, named Polycarp. Okay, so Polycarp... Um, is referred to by uh, some of the ancient writers of the early church. So one of the people whom John discipled later on, uh, it was a person named Polycarp. So Polycarp openly says that it is John who wrote this particular gospel. In the same way, uh, around the time that Polycarp was there, there was another person named um, Papias. And Papias was a leader of the Ephesian church. And he too says that this particular gospel was written by John. So it's basically on the written testimony of certain people like this that we can confidently say that this person whom Jesus, Jesus loved, this disciple whom Jesus loved, it's referring to nobody else but to John himself. Um, Another thing that maybe we can just very briefly touch upon is about this eyewitness report which John is giving. Um, because in the 19th century, after the Industrial Revolution, people began to think that now they are very advanced. Science is becoming you know, very uh, prominent. People are able to invent so many things that earlier people could not even think about. And so now if they have the light, they have the telephone, they have all kinds of advances. So people began to say, oh, all these spiritual things, religious things, it's all, uh, it's all fiction, it's all mythology. And so even as a lot of uh, anti-spiritual you know, criticism began to increase during those early 1900s, people began to say, Ah, this Gospel of John was written in 200 or 300 AD. It was written hundreds of years after Jesus uh, you know, was, uh, ha had uh, died. So we can't really trust what is given in this Gospel of John. So those are the kind of um, you know, um, false criticisms that people began to raise. But um, most scholars will accept the fact that the Gospel of John was probably written around 90 AD which basically means that if the crucifixion of Jesus took place around 33 AD, then within a matter of about 60 years, this gospel was written. And when you look at the details which are there in the gospel, you realize that this is being written by someone who's very familiar with the... So sorry. If you have any water, could I just... Some of the things which uh, you know this writer mentions in the gospel. Some of the details which this uh, you know writer mentions in the gospel, it sounds like as if it is being written by a person who is very familiar with Jerusalem and with the archaeological features over there and things. 
you know in that place for instance you know uh, one example um john mentions the pool of bethesda and he very specifically says that there are five porticos in the pool of bethesda and for a long time you know uh, people were saying no such pool exists it's it was just a fictional story which is mentioned but then uh, later on sometime in the late 1900s i think is when archaeologists actually uncovered the pool of bethesda and they found that it literally actually has got five porticos in the same way in his gospel um john talks about the solomon's portico uh that was the uh, portico which was used uh during the winter season because you know it provided some protection from the wind if you remember the the temple of uh, you know jerusalem temple was uh, built at a greater height so you would have winds you know hitting the that structure uh so solomon's portico was built uh, to protect the people from the winds uh, so that was used in the winter season now these are all details being given by a man who has walked around jerusalem and is very very familiar with jerusalem and the thing to note is that in 70 ad um the entire jerusalem was razed to the ground by the romans so these details are being given by someone who lived before 70 ad and who moved around in jerusalem saw all the you know um buildings and structures uh, with his own eyes and could describe them it could not have been written by someone who came after 70 ad because after 70 ad they would not even see those things in jerusalem anymore and they would not be able to write do, write those things in such uh, you know write about those things in such uh, exact specific detail um uh, he talks about john talks about the stone pavement which was there um in uh, pilate's praetorium you know so these are these are eyewitness uh, accounts which are being given by a person who lived before the destruction of jerusalem so which is why these false criticisms which came up you know in the early 1900s about how the book of john was really not written by john it was written by some stranger who came up with fictional stories all of that is just rubbish uh, because when we look at the detail which is there in this gospel we get the clear picture that here is a man who is talking out of his personal experience he what he has seen with his eyes he is talking about and in fact john makes that point later in his epistles the first epistle which he writes uh, there he very specifically he say he says this jesus we have touched him you know we have spoken to him he literally says that so um, these are uh, this this has been written by a disciple of jesus who literally interacted with the lord all right coming to the place of writing where exactly was this gospel of john written um so we were talking about how john had a disciple later on you know named polycarp um and uh, polycarp had a disciple named irenius so irenius is the one who has written a bunch of historical you know records and irenius mentions in his records that uh, john actually used to live in ephesus uh, so it looks like maybe up to 70 ad john was probably ministering more to the jewish people and then once jerusalem was destroyed you know people uh, the jewish people got scattered all over uh, you know different locations and uh, so then maybe that is when he moved to ephesus and so he spends the rest of his life you know most of his life in ephesus of course later you know he's taken to the um, to the island of patmos and he dies over there uh, so john was living in ephesus for many years and so he most probably wrote this gospel from the location of ephesus and um, we see you know handwritten copies of the gospel of john found even as far as egypt so this gospel which he wrote people made hand copies of that and distributed it all over the mediterranean region so this gospel would have traveled to so many churches it would have been read out in so many places and uh, in each place after reading this gospel people would have discovered who jesus is what he said about himself 
what are the spiritual truths which were being brought out you know all of this uh, would have been uh, made clearer because of this account which john wrote um coming to another point it is generally believed that originally when john wrote the gospel of john he probably wrote only the first 20 chapters because if you look at the very last two verses of john chapter 20 it almost looks like as if he's you know finishing the writing uh, if you can actually maybe read out these last two verses john chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 john 20 30 and 31 john 20 30 and 31 and truly jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these were written that that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that believing you have life in his name it almost sounds like a conclusion right so he's given an account of all the things which jesus said which jesus did all the, uh, the teachings of jesus it's all there and now in the very end he's saying you know uh, many other things also are there but you know um, these specific things have been recorded over here so that you can believe that jesus is the messiah it sounds like a conclusion and there have been many you know handwritten copies which have been found uh, from different um, portions of the mediterranean region where there are only 20 chapters the 21st chapter is not there in those particular handwritten copies so which is why they say that maybe the holy spirit inspired him to add one more chapter later we see this happening again and again in the epistles right where some issue comes up in the church and to address that particular issue the holy spirit inspires paul or some other writer to write a letter to the people so in the same way even over here certain issues must have risen up as a result of which the holy spirit inspires him to add one more extra chapter what could have been these additional issues um the first may have been to you know get to take care of any false rumors that probably would have been spreading what kind of false rumors one false rumor may have been about peter because you know peter denied jesus and then um when uh, peter denies jesus uh, you know jesus looks at him so there might have been rumors going around that peter had fallen away from the faith and things like that so in the 21st chapter you have clearly details mentioned where it shows that jesus reinstated peter okay so uh, this clear um, you know a, a clear narrative given over there that Jesus is still very much uh, in favor of Peter and he still has a purpose and plan for his life because you know Peter is after all now becoming a very prominent leader in the church and so someone had to give us a, an account of the things which happened between Jesus and Peter you know uh, after uh, the denial which he had done so maybe one reason that this last chapter was written is probably to you know to put away any false rumors which were being spread about peter another false rumor which probably was going around is regarding john himself where people are saying wrongly that john is going to stay alive until the return of jesus so he very clearly clarifies that in the 21st chapter john 21 22 to 23 where he says in verse 23 because of this the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So maybe he also wanted to, the Lord also wanted to clarify and uh, get rid of this other false rumor that, you know, John is supposed to stay alive until the second coming. So the 21st chapter was probably written to put away any false rumors that were going around. And then there's a third reason which is given about why this 21st chapter was probably added. Um, this is something that we get from a couple of sources. Uh, there's something called the Muratorian Canon, which talks about this. 
and there's also a writing written by someone named Clement of Alexandria. In both of these places, the Muratorian canon and also in the writing which was written by Clement of Alexandria, they talk about why John wrote this particular gospel. They say that he was urged by his friends and inspired by the Holy Spirit to compose this gospel um, to show that you know Jesus is the Messiah. And then in John 21, 24, there's something which seems to confirm what they are saying. If we can have someone read out for us just that one verse, John 21, 24. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Who wrote these words? We know that his testimony is true. Up to this point, the writer is writing. And now in this last sentence, someone is adding and saying, we know that his testimony is true. So in the Muratorian canon and in the writing done by Clement of Alexandria, uh, you know, uh, over there it says that he was urged by his friends and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to compose this particular gospel. And so after having read all that he has written down in his gospel, these people confirm and say, yes, what this man is writing in this gospel is all true. We authenticate what he is saying. We have, you know, been with him and we do have seen and heard some of the things which took place so we can certify that whatever this person is recording here in this gospel it is actually true so this was a this was a kind of certification which was required because at that time the early church was going through very tough times it's not just the non christian uh, the non-Jewish people who were entering into the Christian faith who were facing opposition, even the Jewish people who were, who were accepting Jesus, they also were facing very severe persecution. So these people needed to have the assurance that whatever they're placing their faith in is really true, that it's 100% authentic. And so at the end of this gospel, which has been written by John, this group of people you know, they come together and they say, we know that what this man has written over here is true. You know, they probably would have put that in their handwriting so that everyone who comes later and reads these uh, you know, details in the gospel will genuinely believe that Jesus is the living God and they would be willing to accept him as Lord and Savior in spite of all the suffering and opposition which they are facing. Okay, so those are just some of the... Um, details regarding the gospel of john now let us actually get into the gospel itself okay so uh, we've spent some time looking at why the gospel was written who wrote it uh, what is the impact it had on the people of that time and now we will get into the actual verses so if we can all turn in our bibles to john chapter 1 we will look at the first 18 verses today because this first 18 verses they form one section and if you look at the um, you know the original greek bible and the way the first 18 verses were written we get the impression that it it's a kind of a poem it almost sounds like a poem um there's a rhythm you know, that was used in writing these 18 verses. Um, so based on that, the pattern of writing that which was used for these 18 verses, the assumption is that maybe this verse, these 18 verses were composed as a kind of a song which the believers would actually sing in the church back in those days. Because in this 18 verses, it's a statement of faith about who Jesus is, about the purpose for which he has come, about the things which he is going to accomplish. It's like a summary of what the rest of the book of John is going to talk about. So if you really want to know all the main themes which are going to be discussed in the Gospel of John, at least a brief mention is made of each of those themes in these first 18 verses. So these first 18 verses 
are almost like an intro. They are like a summary of what the rest of the gospel is going to be talking about. And the pattern of wording which, which is used in writing this, it almost sounds like a poem or a song. So which is why they, it is believed that maybe people actually used to sing these verses. So what we are looking at today is the song. Um, why, uh, you know, uh, why did all these things, you know, need need to be communicated to us? Why was a song made out of it? Uh, why were the people singing these verses? Because there are very foundational truths contained over here. When the Jewish believers are going through tough time in their community, when they are being thrown out of the synagogue, when they are being disbarred, when they are not invited anymore to the you know to, to the uh, weddings of their relatives, when they are being treated like as if they are outsiders, at that time they would sing these eighteen verses to themselves and affirm to themselves and say, "Yes, this is who Jesus is, and that's the reason why I am going through this." persecution. I'm willing to put up with this because I know that he is God. I'm willing to put up with all of this persecution because I know that this decision which I have taken is the correct one. So it is an affirmation to them. In the same way, the Gentiles who were coming to the Lord, they too were going through persecution. They had given up all of their idol worship. They had put aside, um, you know, all of the uh, wrong practices which they used to indulge in before. And so now their relatives and their friends look at them like as if they are, they, are, they know they, they're too holy. They mock them and they say, oh, you think you're better than us, is it? So they too were facing a position. So these were 18 verses when they would sing uh, these verses, it would be an affirmation even to them, you know, uh, uh, to confirm to them that the stand which they have taken for Jesus is indeed the right one. Um, so this prologue, this hymn, uh, it begins with these words, John 1, verses 1 and 2. Yeah, if someone can uh, read out these two verses. In John the, 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Yes. And in fact, we are very familiar with these, uh, with, with, with this verse. Uh, in fact, we have even heard many sermons about this verse. Um, and we are also familiar with the Greek word which is used in that verse. In the beginning was the word. What is the Greek word for that particular phrase? In the beginning was the... You've not heard sermons on this? Logos. That's the word that is just used over there. The Greek word which is used over there. That's the word logos. So in the beginning was the logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And John starts off his gospel with this phrase, with this particular term, Logos, because it, it was a term which the Gentiles would have understood. It is a term which, which even the Jewish people would have understood, and it had some significance for them. So that's the reason that John chooses to start off by using this particular phrase. Um, so when he, he, he doesn't begin by saying, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God. Rather, he chooses to introduce Jesus using this particular title, using this particular phrase, because this phrase would have caught the attention of all the Greek readers. It would also have caught the attention of all the Jewish people. So let's look at the significance of this word, Logos for the Greek people and for the Jewish people. The Greek philosophers, for them, this word Logos almost talked about divinity. Because, you know, Plato, Plato was considered one of their uh, greatest philosophers. So Plato taught them that there is this divine being, not an actual person, but more like a more like an impersonal force, some kind of power which created the world. In the beginning, there was just complete chaos. Nothing existed. And then this powerful being, this powerful force, which 
you know he referred to which plato referred to as the ultimate reason reason so this force which which could reason and think it began to create order out of the chaos okay so that was the uh, greek belief system so plato taught that there's this universal powerful force which has got reasoning power which is intelligent and it brought order out of the chaos so in the basic mind of the greek logos is equal to divinity now john is using that very specific word over here and he is saying you know what this logos which you people keep talking about this logos was with god and this logos was god so then any greek who's reading this first two verses would immediately nod their heads and say yeah yeah you're right you're correct because you see they agree with this idea that this logos is divinity um but then when john moves through a few verses and then he comes to the point where he says in john 1:14 the logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us that would have been very very shocking for the greeks to hear at this point by verse 14 they would say no we don't believe what you are saying beginning first verses they would accept and say yeah yeah we know we already know logos is the divine being which brought order out of chaos but they would not be happy with verse 14 where it says the logos became flesh because in the greek thinking in their philosophy the divine being the spirit being it is pure it is it is perfect on the other hand anything which is material is automatically evil so they differentiated between the spirit and matter anything which can be touched is matter and it is unclean so you know we'll get into the details of this when we come back from our uh, break all right thank you